So Paul, we've seen that we can use gravity to measure how much my force is on you, how the ice is changing in it uh, in the Greenland, but clearly A, someone had to figure this out, and, and then B, how do we go and start applying this to, say, the sun or things that are really far away? Well, now that we know how far away the sun is, we can actually calculate how much gravity it applies to the Earth because it bends the Earth to go in orbit around the sun. So that's kind of our, our measurement of the effect of its gravity, our yes. bending and orbiting. So we know how much it's pulling the Earth. It's pulling the Earth so the Earth goes in a circle rather than just off on a straight line, which is what things normally do in space if left to themselves. Yep. So we know how strong the gravity, what the gravitational force of the sun is. And we know how far away it is. So if we could measure the gravity of anything on Earth, yep. if, for example, we actually measure that the gravity from you is a, a micronewton or whatever it is, yep. And then we know how heavy you are and how far away you are. We could then scale up and say, well, we know the gravity from the, from the sun is so much larger, it's so much further away, yep. and therefore work out the weight of the sun. So, and so we essentially kind of reverse engineer the problem. Yes. Right? We, we see, we know where we are, we know where I am, we know how much in theory I or you or something weighs, and we know how far away the sun is, so therefore we can figure out how much it weighs. Yes. Okay. The trouble is, we need to measure these incredibly small well, one thirty thousandth of a mosquito type forces on Earth. And if we could measure that, we can then use it to work out the mass of the Earth, the mass of the Sun, the mass of Jupiter, the mass of anything by looking at how strong their gravity is and their distance. Well, I mean, it's great nowadays that we have lasers and stuff, but in the 1600s, they didn't quite have that technology. Yes, so this experiment, there's a very classic experiment done by a guy called Cavendish in the uh, late 18th century. Okay. So. How, how would you set about trying to measure this? Presumably you'd want to have put a mass there and measure how much it pulls something. Yeah, but you'd also need to have it somewhat larger. Obviously, if we're trying to measure, clearly, if I'm one thirty thousandth of a mosquito, I'm not a lot, so you want something decently heavy. But can't we also use the way gravity works in potentially different directions almost? Yeah, well, here's what he set out to do. So the idea was is that you had what's called a torsion beam. So there's this big wooden beam across the bottom there with two little weights at either end. Yep. And it's suspended by a cable. So, so it's, it's hanging down. Hanging down. Yep. And the idea is it, it, you want to apply a sideways force to twist it. Yep. And what he then did is had a separate beam with two much larger weights. Okay. And he'd put the weights so that one of them is on this side here and one is on the other side there. And the idea is the gravity of this big weight pulling on the small weight would cause that torsion beam to Just rotate like slightly. Yep. It'll pull this one towards us and that one right. away from us. So it's essentially spinning around like a disc almost. Yes, yes only a very tiny, yes. tiny, tiny amount. But the trouble is, um, it's so many other things that can disturb this. Yes, I say, I mean, there's clearly a lot of just random variations on Earth, as we've even seen, that could affect this sort of measurement, right? For example, if the experimenter walked nearby, his or her gravity might pull We have the thing. a little bit of gravity, that's right. These things were heavier than the typical experimenter, uh, but um, a bigger problem was actually air currents. I was going to say, yeah, isn't there wind? Like, how do you shield this perfectly? They all have vacuum chambers. So what they did was he built a, a big sealed wooden shed. Okay. And he would never go in it, so he built little telescopes at either end so he could examine things from outside without getting anywhere near, so his gravity affects things and without the heat of his body and wind currents disturbing anything. So he kind of isolated it as much as possible and only viewed from the outside what was happening. Yeah. Yes. So what he would do is he'd set the whole experiment up and he had a, a, a rope from outside that yep. could control where these big weights were. So initially they were a long way away. Yep. And then he'd pull this so the big weights came really close, at which point it should have pulled the small weights a little bit to the side. Yep. And then by looking through the telescopes, he had a vernier scale so he could measure like a tenth or a hundredth of a millimetre changes and see that they moved sideways slightly. Okay. So by shortening the distance, the force should obviously change between the two, but it wasn't changing just in that direction. Yeah, and so that was the idea. What, what he did was he actually found out, he first of all took the weights away and let the whole thing vibrate, yep. and this period of vibration tells you how stiff the spring is. How, okay. yep. So that tells you what force you need to move it, say, by a millimetre to the side. And then he let the vibration stop, and then he'd move the big weights in and see the very small movement to the side, and he could then work out what the force was that these big things were applying to the small weights. Yep. So now we have our, our big weights and we know how much force is applying to the small weights. 
Now, how do we then just jump to getting the measurement of the sun? Well, it was a bit more complicated than that. For example, he discovered when he first did the experiment that uh, when he moved the weights nearer, the things shifted, yep. but then kept shifting over a few minutes. And Wait, it turned, so, so they just kept drifting away after they... You'd think stopped. that when you moved the weight near and then froze it, the thing would bend a bit to the side and then stop. Yep. But in fact, they kept on moving. Okay. It turned out what was happening was that some of the weights were actually a slightly different temperature from the rest of the shack, and there was an air current, a conduct, convection current going well, around them. So heat was essentially coming off of them, causing him to slightly... So move. he did a whole bunch of experiments where he put the two weights in a bucket, bucket of ice before putting them out first, or then he'd put a candle inside them to warm them up. And eventually he realised he had to have the two weights at very precisely the same temperature as the outside air oh, and okay. only then could he make the measurement okay. so it's a really good careful bit of experimental mm. science i'll post the paper on the website for this if you want to read it said, there's a lot of little detail here that you'd have to take into account that i think most people would even consider yes but he did a very very careful job and was able to find out the gravity of these weights on the small weights yep. and he knew the distance between them he knew how much they both weighed and then he can say right so that's the gravity of 100 kilogram weight on something this nearby. Yep. We're now distance to the sun much further away, but gravitational force much larger. Therefore, how much does the sun weigh? Or also, we could do it for the Earth. You could say, how much is the Earth pulling you down? I know I feel such a drag. The Earth is sucking me down with its gravity. It always is, Paul. And uh, again, we can work out how heavy I are, how far away I am from the center of the Earth, yep. and therefore work out the mass of the Earth. And so it's just by seeing how these two balls essentially interacting, or these two weights interacting. Yes, so you can have a shed in country estate somewhere in England and use it to measure the mass of the sun and the earth, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. It kind of is. Now, how, how close, how accurate was it? Actually, extremely accurate, within a few percent. So oh, really? It did a good job, and it wasn't improved until the late 19th century. Went to, oh, yeah, I assume it Even today, this is a difficult measurement. Our, our value of the strength of gravity is not the, mo is the least well known of all the physical constants. Yeah. Um, what he discovered, so the mass of the Earth is about 5.9 by 10 to the 24 kilograms, which is a lot. A lot. Of course, a lot more than me or you. Um, but if you then divide that by the volume of the Earth, it turns out the average density of the Earth is about 5,500 kilograms per cubic metre. Okay. And that's actually interesting because the typical density of rocks near the Earth's surface is less than that. It's only two or 3,000 kilograms per Which cubic metre. Which means that it has to be denser deeper to in order to average this out. And in fact, this is the first evidence that the Earth has an iron core. Okay. Because the middle of the Earth is much denser because it's a large ball of molten iron right down there several thousand kilometers beneath our feet. Well, so it's essentially what you're talking about in the last video, right? You can use your little uh, gravitometer to see underneath the golf course. We can see the ice sheets by using how the gravity is looking down. You can see hidden mass essentially underneath the Earth. That's right. But now if we get to the sun, finally, at long last, after all these digressions, its weight, weight is about 2 by 10 to the 30 kilograms, a number both of us probably have itched in our <laughs> brains. And so, you know, we're, we're talking about a lot more compared to the Earth. Nearly a million times more than the mass of the Earth. But the density is very different. Yeah, so it's a million times more than half a million times more than the mass of the Earth, which sounds a lot, yeah. but the sun's also an awful lot bigger. So if you divide that larger mass by the enormous volume, it actually turns out that the density of the sun is quite low. It's, so it's only a little bit more than the density of water. Water is about a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So this means that the sun is a dramatically different in terms of what's in it compared to the earth. And it's also just not that dense. Yeah. So that's our next clue as to what the sun is. I mean, it's not bad, I mean, denser than water, but not by a lot. So by figuring out its mass, we are able to see its density, which tells us that it's made up of different stuff to the Earth. Um, well, it could be the same stuff, but just hotter. Okay. I mean, it could be if you took all the stuff the Earth has made of. In fact, this is what people believe for hundreds of years, that the sun was made of the same stuff as the Earth, only but hotter. Just really hot. And the, really, the heat made the density lower, which is, okay. sounds plausible. Okay. But we'll have to go on and in our next video, try and work out actually what the sun is made out of. Okay.